Good morning. It always surprises me when that starts. <laughs> Welcome to worship this morning. Um, there are several announcements in your bulletin, and as usual, there are announcements that in your bulletin that are not quite right. So the weather this week has been wonderful, hasn't it? We've had rain, and we've had dirt rain, and then now today it just blew us into the sanctuary. And it's very difficult to imagine that Easter Sunday morning is going to be just absolutely 100% warm and toasty. So <laughs> you never know. It probably will be. But um, for planning purposes, that makes Easter Sunday kind of hard to plan. So we were planning on having worship um, outdoors at the 1030 service. And that, that seems to be very difficult to, put our, to, to wrap my mind around. And, and so the um, executive committee has been talking this week. And we, um, we are deciding that we're going to have all of the services in the sanctuary on Easter Sunday. And hopefully um, that will allow us to spread out well and distance and wear masks and so forth. So, um, so that's the new plan. Easter Sunday morning, all of the services in here will have one at 6.30, one at 8.15, one at 10.30. Um, and we will make sure that we spread out at least six feet apart in between family units um, or those that are close to each other. So, um, so if, there's, if there's need for extra room, our plan will be to move out into the narthex and have extra space there. But really there should be plenty of room because there's room in the back and there's room upstairs in the balcony and hopefully there'll be room for everybody. Um, let's see. Other announcements that are coming up. April is going to be a busy month. We have our confirmation students um, ready to receive confirmation or to be, to be welcomed into our congregation as confirmed adults. This year's eighth grade students that will be confirming their faith are Elizabeth Welsh, Brinley Sharp, Linnea Welsh, and Melanie Wiggins. And, um, and one of the things that we would like to do is to encourage them into their adult faith by, by sending letters of support and encouragement and prayers from our congregation. So if you have time and would be willing to, write a note of, of encouragement to each of these girls, or if there's one of them that you're closer to than others that you'd like to write to, please consider um, writing them a note. It could, include, it could include anything. It could just include a, a, a note that says, we're so glad you're part of our church. It could include something more personal. It could include your favorite hymn or Bible verse and a little note as to why that it's important to your faith just to sort of encourage them in your, theirs. And what we'd like to do is, is gather all of these notes into a binder to present to them on Confirmation Sunday on April 25th. So we would need the notes to our office by April 18th so that we have enough time to compile them and put them all together. But I know from students in the past that these are really... Um, important and, and, and treasured gifts from our congregation. So if you're able to, take some time and write them. And you can, you can hand them to me in person or you can email them to me um, at my email address. It's in the bulletin. And um, we'll put them all together. Um, the rest of Holy Week, just remember that we have um, worship on Monday, Thursday at 7, on Good Friday at 4 and 7, and then we have our Easter services. Um, we're still planning on having our continental breakfast in between worship services outdoors. So um, hopefully it will be a real nice day and we can gather in the courtyard for breakfast and enjoy um, a continental breakfast together between the 6.30 and 8.15 services. Okay. The rest of the announcements, there are a lot of them in our bulletin today, and I would just encourage you to read them on your own. Um, you're interested in a mission trip, Nebraska is planning one, um, to help out with the flooding that happened um, in 2019 that they're still recovering from in Fremont. And I think, I don't know that there's a cost for it. I think that it's just a volunteer thing. But anyways, that's in your bulletin this morning too. Other announcements today? How about others to remember in our prayers? Then let's begin our worship. We rise and we confess our sins and we hear God's promise of forgiveness and grace. Oops, we have to confess first. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, 
One God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws close to us in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your Holy Spirit over us. Our sin is heavy. We long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and the power of God, your sins are forgiven and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God of steadfast love, you draw us to yourself, and in mercy you receive our prayers. Strengthen us to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, that through life and death we may live in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading this morning comes from the book of Isaiah. Jeremiah. All right. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put the law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to one another, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Our second reading today comes from the book of Hebrews. 
Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Hear the word of the Lord. Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 12th chapter. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Jesus answered them, Philip and Andrew went to Philip told Andrew, and then Andrew went and told Philip, and who went and told Jesus. Jesus answered, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it from for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save them from me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven came. I have glorified, and I will glorify again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. This time I would invite our young people forward for a children's message. Do you know what this is? Come here. Let's see. Do you know what this is right here? Have you ever seen these before? What do you think it is? What is that? Those are seeds. Do you know what you do with them? These are sunflower seeds, so sometimes we eat them, don't we? But this particular kind, I don't think are going to taste very good because you know what their job is? We're supposed to plant them in the ground and then they'll grow into a sunflower like this. Do you ever plant anything in your house? No? Well, that's what will happen to them. And you know, once you plant it in the ground, do you think you'll ever see that little seed again? Only if you dug it up, right? Otherwise, you'll never see it again. But you will, if you give it some time, pretty soon see this great big plant start to grow. 
And that's, I think, what Jesus is talking about today. He's talking about, he says, if you plant a seed in the ground, it, if you don't plant a seed in the ground, it remains just a single seed. But if you plant it in the ground, it grows into something bigger. And inside of here, all of this part of the sunflower plant will eventually become way more seeds. Can you believe that? Like hundreds of them will be in there. Isn't that cool? So that, so that if you let it grow long enough, you'll have lots and lots and lots of seeds instead of just a few. Anyways, Jesus is talking about our life too, and he talks about this, and he says, sometimes, well, always when people die, it's like planting a seed, because we, we think that we'll never, ever see them again, but just like God makes seeds grow into great big plants, God gives us new life and new beginnings, and even, even our sad places of death are not an end, they're a beginning. So we, so we have faith and we plant seeds and we know that when we, when we lose someone or love a loved one that's special to us, that, that God has them in his hands and that God will give them new life. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of seeds and for the hope of new beginnings. And thank you for the gift of life and the promise that you never let us go. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I put them back in there? Okay, now here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a new package of seeds that aren't opened yet, okay? And I don't think sunflower seeds are the best thing to send you home with because they get really big. But how about something like that? Does that look pretty? So you take these home. And you find a spot at your house where you can plant them. And if you don't have a spot, you can always get a, a tub and you can put some dirt in it and plant them in your tub and you can grow it out on a basket. But you grow these and you watch those seeds change from little seeds to plants this year, okay? Project? Okay, here you go. Thanks for coming up. Thank you. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you this day from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
In northern Minnesota, planting season won't come around for another two months yet. But planting season will come. And when it comes, we will plant all those seeds, just like we talked about in our children's sermon this morning. And do you know how many tears will be shed over planting the seeds? None. I don't believe we'll, we'll shed a single tear over planting the seeds because everybody who plants seeds knows that if you'd never plant a seed, they'll never grow to their full potential. They'll never become the thing that God created that seed to be. You have to plant it in order for it to grow. I remember when I was in, in elementary school, and one of the experiments that we got to do as part of our science class was to watch a bean seed develop. We put the bean seed on top of a wet tissue paper, and then we wrapped it all in a plastic bag, and we put it in the window so that we could see what happened to the seed as it transformed. It was amazing to watch first the roots come out and then the shoot come up, and then pretty soon the whole seed broke away, and you couldn't even tell that it was there before because it dissolved into the plant and became the nourishment that started the plant off in the right journey. The seed's job is to disappear so that life can continue and new seeds can form. And when we plant it in the ground, we next to never cry about it because that's the hope. That's the new beginning, isn't it? Jesus wants us to dwell a bit on seed transformation today. He's begging his disciples to do this as he declares, His hour has come. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, Jesus says it remains a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. It's not so unsettling to think about a seed being planted in the ground. But it is unsettling to think about a loved one being planted in the ground or ourselves being planted in the ground or Jesus being planted in the ground, isn't it? Very unsettling to think about that. Isn't it interesting that Jesus gives us something that is as easy as planting a seed to use as as an image for thinking about death? I think that's amazing. And when I think about the promise of new life that Jesus is going to bring us through the death and resurrection on the cross and the new beginnings that he brings, I think it's a beautiful image that he's given us, isn't it? Why is it that today of all days in our gospel reading, Jesus has decided that the hour has come? All along Mark, I mean John, sorry, all along the Gospel of John, Jesus does big things, and then he says, my hour hasn't come yet. But today we get to the reading, and he says, today my hour has come. Why is that? Why is today the day that the hour has come, I wonder? Before this, in our Gospel passage, Jesus has just entered into Jerusalem to shouts of Hosanna. And right before that, he has just raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. So now he's in Jerusalem, and people are gathering around him. They're gathering around him because they've heard. They've heard the shouts of Hosanna. They've heard the promise that he might be the Messiah that they've all been looking for. They've heard that he has raised someone from the dead. And they're all wondering who this Jesus is. And suddenly, it's not just the Jewish people that are wondering this, it's the Gentiles too, right? Some Gentiles come to Philip and they say, we want to see Jesus. And Philip takes them to Andrew, and Andrew and Philip take the story to Jesus. And that's when Jesus says, my hour has come. Why is it that it takes the Gentiles showing up for Jesus' hour to come? I think it's probably this. Remember last Sunday's gospel where we had John 3.16 as part of our reading? For God to love the world, not, not just a group of small group, right? The whole world. That everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. 
That's what Jesus is looking for. The whole world starting to pay attention to God's grace and mercy and forgiveness. Everyone starting to embrace the Lord as their Savior. So far in the gospel, he's been talking a lot to people of his own faith, to the folks in his Jewish religion. Now suddenly, the Gentiles, which represent the rest of the world, starts to pay attention. And even though there's just a couple, all of a sudden, the rest of the world is starting to notice. And now Jesus says, now my hour has come. Because you see, Jesus hasn't just come to forgive a small group of people. Jesus has come to forgive everyone. Absolutely everyone. Now my hour has come. Now we'll discover what God's glory is really about. Those who flocked to Jesus were looking for him to be the Messiah. They were looking for him to dismantle Rome's hold on the world, to discard the government's oppressive taxes, to establish a new kingdom with Christ. Many ways, the religious leaders feared this because they were afraid that if Jesus tried to dismantle Rome, all that would happen was a whole bunch of dead people. People had tried to dismantle Rome in the past, and all that resulted was a whole lot of dead people. So the religious leader said, this can't be. We can't have Jesus making this kind of disturbance in the world. All that will result is terrible massacre. So we'll sacrifice one person for the sake of many. That was the assessment of the religious leaders. And if you put yourself in their position, where would you end up? Yet Jesus says that his hour has come, and he launches into an entirely different discussion of what this hour looks like. People are looking for him to be an authoritative Messiah, become the king, take over Rome, change the world entirely as we know it. But Jesus has a different plan for how that's going to look, how he will change the world entirely. My hour has come, he says, and then he says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. In the days that follow, Jesus will humble himself. He'll take up the role of servant and wash the disciples' feet, declaring that those who follow him must become a servant and love unconditionally. He will be arrested and tried and hung on a cross, where he will serve the whole world by joining each of us in our most broken place. In the place where we are abandoned and alone, in the place where our, our sins and our shortfalls are laid bare and displayed for the whole world to see, in the place where we are sick, in the place where we are struggling with all kinds of pain and with dying, and even those that we love can't completely join us in that place. But Jesus will choose to be there and comfort us. Jesus dies on the cross because life doesn't get much harder than the cross. And so, when God so loves the world, God chooses his son to join us and love us through our most terrible place. Death is something that we will all face alone, but because Christ took on the cross, even death doesn't separate us from God. God will change the world by sending his son to be with each and every one of us when our world is falling apart. Think of the difference that that will make. And here lies the amazing thing Jesus says to us today. It's the story of a seed. Even death does not end the story. It is simply a new beginning. Becoming king of the world may have seemed to some people in the short term the best plan. Of course, I don't suppose the Romans would have liked it. And, ironically, 
They are part of the world that God so loves and that God came to save. Becoming king would be a lot like becoming part of the problem, wouldn't it? It'd be a lot like setting a seed on the shelf, never to become what God truly intended that seed to be. Yet in dying and being buried in an earthen tomb, Jesus becomes the God who is with us every step of the journey. The Lord who never lets us go. There is no place in the whole world that we will ever face that is beyond God's scope of love and protection. And Jesus, like the seed, does not disappear forever once placed in the tomb. Jesus rises from the dead and opens the grave to a whole new beginning of possibilities. Death is not the end of Christ's story. New life is. And so death will not be the end of our story. We will also have new life with God. Because of Jesus, we can trust that our death and those of, the, of loved ones, hard as they are, carry with them the hope of a seed. When we are one day planted in the ground, we can trust that the seed will transform to something new and Christ will bring new life even out of death. Still, I don't believe that Jesus invited us to consider just our physical death this morning. In following Jesus, we are invited to take up Christ's cross and to lose our lives in order that new life may rise here and now. Think of all the times that this happens. When have you allowed a biting word that you have wanted to say to die on the edge of the tip of your tongue in order that a relationship may continue to live. It's like planting a seed, isn't it? The word dies in order that life with others can continue. When have you given up on fighting in order to preserve a way that things used to be so that you could embrace the potential of a new beginning in some way? When have you wrestled with something, with giving up something, in order to secure the risk that the Holy Spirit is nudging you to hold on to? This, I think, is something that every disciple is called to do. The ones who stood in Jesus' presence that day, they did this. And we are part of the new crop they planted by going out and sharing the good news. We, too, are called to do the same for the next new crop, so that the next new crop may grow and flourish. Yet there's always risk in laying down our lives. Something will die. Yet, I have never mourned the death of a seed. Instead, I rejoice in its potential. There's an interesting thing happening in the neighborhood I grew up in. Dad's been talking about it now for a while, and it's kind of fun to listen to him talk about it. Our town hall, you have to remember, I grew up in the middle of next to nowhere. I mean, you can look in any direction from my farm and not see another farm for a mile or two. Anyways, all of that region is governed by townships. Townships are a square six foot mile, a square, six square mile track of land, and township officers are responsible for making sure that the roads and the ditches and the things that are needed to keep the community functioning happen. So anyways, on our town hall is dad's old one-room schoolhouse that he grew up in. It's really old, but it was the, it's kind of the only community building in our township. So it's the place where town meetings happen. When I was young, it was the place where 4-H Club met. And it's a one-room schoolhouse, and it has no running water. It has an outhouse outside, the, outside of the town hall, and the outhouse was scary enough that mom would say, now make sure you use the restroom before we go to the 4-H meeting because you don't want to have to use that outhouse. And let me tell you, I did not want to have to use that outhouse. In fact, I worked really hard to make sure I didn't. Hold it till you get home. Yuck. Anyways, that's the town hall. And it is a place, honestly, of great joy to me because we had a lot of fun in that old town hall. Not to mention, 
It's a place of our community's history, right? I mean, Dad grew up there, and my grandma, Grandma Rose, she was the school teacher in that town hall. So every time I go there, I feel like I'm embracing like the entire foundation of my being. That's what that town hall kind of means to me. But the fact is, the foundation underneath of it is starting to crumble. The basement that Dad says he used to play games in, it's been so scary, we've never been down in that basement. The outhouse is a miserable mess. The roof is starting to get bad. And so the question has been happening for the last several years. Should we refurbish the town hall that exists? Or should we do something different? So at this year's annual meeting, the township talked about it. And the community gathered, and it was fun because all of them, or most of them, have those ties to that building. And yet it's not functional anymore. It's not doing what it was supposed to do anymore. So they're getting bids. And the plan is, the plan is to probably tear down that old schoolhouse and build a new building with, get this, running water. How about that? And a bathroom or two. And a place where the community can gather. And one neighbor said, maybe we should even think about a way to put some basketball hoops up in or around the building so that the community kids don't have to drive to town to play together. Will we grieve the old town hall? My guess is the day that it comes down, I'll shed a tear or two even if I won't see it come down. Because you see, I have some heart wrapped into that building. But it is only a building. And right now, it's a building that is not functional. It's not gathering the community like it was called to do. So it's time. And they're going to invest a profound amount of money in a brand new building. Because why? Because community matters. And because a place for people to get together matters. And because talking to neighbors and working out problems side by side matters. And you have to have a space to do that. So a seed will die, and will remember the gift of that seed, because it did many good things. But it will plant the possibility of something new, and that will produce many more seeds in the future to come. And there is great hope in that. So the question today, I think, that Jesus is asking us all to wrestle with, again and again and again, all life long, is what seeds in my life is the Spirit nudging me to have the courage to plant and let die in order that God's Spirit can grow something new in my life and in the world around me? It's never an easy thing to wrestle with. And yet, we have faith in the Lord who died to give new life to the entire world. So let us trust in that hope and let us not shed too many tears because God brings new beginnings. And once the tears have been shed, when we look back at it all, we'll see the goodness of God's work. Amen. Thanks be to God.
Let us confess our faith today in God in whom we place our lives and our trust. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his Holy Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all who are in need. You wash us through and through and remember our sins no more. Make your church a community of forgiveness throughout the world. Give your people courage to forgive. Through, the, through them, show the world new possibilities. Bless ministries of repentance and reconciliation. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You fill the earth from tiny grains of wheat to mighty thunder with your presence, and you call us to attend to your will for all creation. Grant weather that prepares the soil for seeds. Protect us from all violent storms, flooding, and wildfires. Especially we pray for those that are recovering from harsh winter weather and recent storms. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You promise to write your law on our hearts. Guide citizens throughout the world to shape communities that reflect your mercy, justice, and peace and give them creativity to work for the welfare of all. We pray especially for decisions that our schools are making for our county, city, and state government leaders and committees, for pop-up food pantries, libraries, and other small ways that we share with each other, and for organizations like Foster Care Closet that respond with arms of compassion in the midst of hurt. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Restore the joy of all those who need to know your presence, those who are lonely or feel unforgivable, those who need healing in mind or body, those who are dying and all who grieve. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Jesus calls us to follow him in life and death. Empower this congregation Equip children and teachers, Sunday school confirmation and learning, and learning ministries. Give us the truth and wisdom to teach us and teach us to follow. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. In the cross of Christ, you name, your name is glorified. We bring to you the grief of all the loved ones we have lost this year. Fill our sorrow with the hope of life everlasting in you. We remember today especially all who are sick and in need of your care and those who are grieving when we bring them to you in the quiets of our hearts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Please turn to your neighbors and share that peace from a distance today. That's peace. And at this time, we remember our offering today. Offering can be placed at the, in the basket at the back of the church. Um, and it can be given online as well or sent in the mail. And remember that offering is, is what we do in our everyday lives. So today, today God calls us to consider how we might offer our lives, what seeds we might plant in the world around us that, that God might help grow. Let us pray. Faithful God, you walk beside us in desert places. 
and you meet us in our hunger with bread from heaven. Accompany us in this meal that we may pass over from death to life in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated as we prepare for Holy Communion today. We raise our bread together in blessing. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take the cup. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The meal is ready. Take and eat the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Now please rise as you are able and receive this blessing. Now may the Lord, may the grace of God bless you and keep you and keep you forever in God's grace and love. Amen. Let us pray. God of steadfast love at this table, you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of the Spirit that our lives bear witness to the love that is made new in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We are sent out to love and serve God with our lives. We go with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>